Magog invasion. How close are we? Uh, as we go through this, I'm going to talk really fast <laughs> because there's a lot to cover. Uh, I want to I want to kind of teach through the text, uh, of course, uh, that's here and identify all the major players. Uh, but there's so much to cover, and a lot of you, you know, we've been through it before. It's been a few years, uh, but uh, for most of you, it's going to be kind of a refresher. Uh, and, uh, and if it's the first time you're, you're hearing it all, then we'll just pray for God's mercy that you'll be able to absorb uh, uh, part of it. Uh, there's no test later. Uh, it's just uh, so you can get a sense of what's going on in the world today. And some of the things that have changed uh, recently in the Russian economy uh, that makes uh, this war in the Middle East uh, seem like a little closer than it was even just uh, a month or so uh, ago. I-, I wanted to begin by reading uh, a quote from uh, uh, General Sharon uh, Erin. He was uh, uh, moved to the United States uh, uh, but uh, in the 70s, but uh, uh, you know, he was a consultant for the DOD and the American intelligence agencies, uh, he, part of the uh, British Army in World War II, uh, Israeli a general in the uh, Israeli Defense Forces and so forth, all to say this is somebody that knows what he's talking about. And, uh, and when we talk about the Magog invasion, uh, we're talking about uh, Russia, uh, in a group of Islamic states, uh, including Turkey and Persia, uh, which is uh, today Iran, uh, coming together uh, with an all-out assault uh, on the nation of Israel. Uh, God intervenes supernaturally uh, and destroys them. That's the, uh, there's a war going on certainly right now because of ISIS in the Middle East, uh, but uh, there's a much bigger war uh, here in the future that Ezekiel the prophet describes in this alliance with Russia <laughs> Russia is really, the, and Putin is really the bully on the block. He's the guy that calls the shots and pretty much controls everything. Their economy is predicated on two things, oil uh, and, and weapons. That's what they export, that's what they, they sell. Uh, he, has a, uh, he has been the one that has been uh, building his military since 2004. He put a 40% increase in the military budget. Uh, he, he looks and acts and talks like he's about ready to, uh, uh, to go to war. Uh, and he has a close uh, alliance with uh, the nation of Iran. Uh, Iran, of course, is uh, building as fast as they can, uh, uh, not just an atomic bomb, but bombs, many. I heard the statistic a few weeks ago, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, Iran has more centrifuges spinning today than there are Starbucks in the United States. If you've traveled around, there's a lot of Starbucks, they're like everywhere, but they have more. They're, they're not just trying to make a bomb, they may already have enough for a bomb, they're trying to make many. Uh, they uh, also are trying to now develop medium and long-range missiles uh, so that they can reach more than just uh, Israel. Uh, it's a concern for the world. That's why there's talks going on in Geneva right now with uh, uh, Senator, uh, Secretary of State Kerry uh, and others, uh, and that's not going, going well. But uh, this all began uh, nearly three dec- decades ago. Let me uh, quote uh, uh, gen- from General uh, Shimon Ereng. He says, more than three decades ago, as the Ayatollah Khomeini returned to Iran from France, where he had been living in exile, and Islamic students protested against the Shah, a group of Iranian generals approached then Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter and said, if you will keep Russia from interfering in our internal matters, we will maintain control. Carter rebuffed them, telling them that the U.S. would not get in the way of a democratic change. So the Shah is ruling in Iran. There's no terrorists there. They're not developing any uh, 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 atomic bombs. They're not exporting terrorists around the world. Uh, He may not have been a a good guy, nice guy, but he was an ally. His general said to Carter, if you'll help keep Russia out of us and out of our way, we can kind of maintain control. Uh, And uh, uh, Jimmy Carter refused to, uh, to do that. Uh, and he said and, uh, uh, the results, the Shah was overthrown and fled the country. Khomeini was installed as Iran's uh, uh, leader and the international terrorist group originated by the Iranian regime began branching out all over the world. They have a foothold in South America with an alliance with uh, Venezuela's President Hugo Chavez, opening the door to the possibility that once Iran has nuclear arms, they will share them with the Venezuelan strongmen. From South America, the Iranian-led terror network has spread into the United States, that's us, establishing terrorist cells in neighborhoods like ours across the nation. All of this because one American president made the decision that democracy forced him not to do anything to stop uh, Islamic takeover in Iran. We're kind of paying the price for it uh, ever since. That was the, uh, the beginning of the end, uh, uh, in a sense. I remember when uh, Admiral uh, Mike Mullins was the uh, Joint Chief of Staff 
uh, and he was talking about the war on terrorism, and he said that it would be a, a multi-generational war. Multi-generational, like your kids and your kids and your kids after them will be fighting this thing. Uh, but uh, that all may come to an end uh, through the uh, prophecy of, of Ezekiel here uh, that all begins uh, in 1979. No interference. Uh, you have the Islamic State of uh, Iran that takes over. You know, all of our uh, embassy officials and, and uh, our Marine guards and so forth are, of course, captured in the embassy, and, and it took uh, an election of Ronald Reagan to get them uh, released. Uh, and that happens uh, again a few years later. Uh, set the next stage for a much change in the geopolitical world, uh, speaking of uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, in the October 23rd, 1983, I think we've got a picture of it, we have the uh, bombing of, in Beirut uh, of the barracks uh, in which uh, <coughs> two truckloads of terrorists <coughs> committed what <coughs> we're very familiar with now in terms of a, a suicide bombing. At the time, it was like, we were shocked that someone would <coughs> blow themselves up in order to kill someone else. Uh, this was uh, done by a group at the time calling themselves Islamic Jihad. Uh, later, they became known as Hezbollah, and uh, certainly they are still well established now in Syria and in, in uh, southern uh, Lebanon. The uh, <coughs> 220 Marines were killed, uh, 18 Navy personnel, three Army soldiers, uh, along with 60 other Americans that were uh, injured. Uh, it was a single largest uh, death toll for the United States Marine Corps since the Battle of Iwo Jima uh, in World War II, the single deadliest death toll for the United States military since the first day of the Tet Offensive during the Vietnam War, and the deadliest uh, single attack on Americans overseas since uh, World War II. Uh, so that happens, and uh, a friend of mine was actually there at the time uh, in the Marine Corps uh, and uh, was not injured in the attack, pastor in the Calvary Chapel over on Kauai uh, today. Uh, but uh, remembers it very well, as, long as, as well as a lot of Marines that are kind of the, I would say if they're, if they're in the 50s or 60s, they, uh, they can tell you exactly the date and exactly how many, how many died. It was a game changer. What happened then is that President Reagan, you know, obviously not understanding what was about ready to come upon the world and the dynamics that this would create, <clears throat> he chose to remove all of those Marines and all that military personnel uh, and get them out of Lebanon for fear of something like that happening again. What that did then, it showed Hezbollah and the rest of the Islamic world, we can beat the United States. Here's how we do it. We do it through terrorism. We do it through suicide attacks. We do it through bombing and so forth. And it emboldened them and grew their organization to what it was today. If Ronald Reagan, many say, had gone ashore with those Marines and hunted down every Hezbollah they could find, however far they had to go to get them and killed every one of them, <coughs> we wouldn't be fighting these wars that we are, are today. But uh, uh, major changes, 1979, 1983, uh, have brought upon us the, the war of terrorism uh, that we're fighting today. Uh, Russia's involvement, as my point, goes back all the way to 1979. Uh, they are certainly, and we'll show how directly they involved they are uh, with Iran and uh, the Magog invasion. Uh, coming very soon. I want to show you a couple of slides. Oh, did we go by those already? Yeah. So this is a slide that you will not see on the evening news. Uh, and, that's, uh, and the reason for that is because uh, that little place right there, that's Israel. And, uh, and so they'll never show you this slide. When they talk about Israel, they'll never show this because that's way bigger. That's way bigger. That's way bigger. That's way bigger. They're surrounded by these massive uh, Islamic countries that are uh, pretty much their enemies. We'll, we'll tell you a few exceptions here in a moment, but they won't show you that map. Uh, but again, the Magog invasion, uh, again, here's Russia, the Kakistan, Uzbekistan, the Turks, uh, and so forth. These guys are all involved uh, with Iran, uh, with Turkey. They're going to march down through Syria, to the mountains, according to the prophet Ezekiel. And then you've got uh, folks from uh, North Africa uh, that are going to counter up through this way as well. And they're, they're all involved. Go on to the, the next map. Uh, this is the map that you see on the news at night when they talk about Israel. It looks a lot bigger, doesn't it? <laughs> but just to show you, see this part right here? That's where most of the people live and everything. This is kind of desert down here. This part right here, it's, it's, it's a little smaller than the big island. <laughs> yeah, that helps us. When they say, it's about the size of New Jersey, we all go, well, okay, what does that mean? But uh, uh, maybe that helps you put it in context. It's not that big. It's this little sliver of land. Uh, along the, uh, the edge of the Mediterranean. Uh, they have already given the Gaza Strip uh, to the Palestinians. And uh, the first thing they did is have a civil war. And, uh, and then Hamas took over, drove, drove the Palestinian Authority guys out and into the West Bank. 
And, uh, and we don't even have time this morning to deal with the whole what's going on with the, uh, the Palestinians uh, and their attempts uh, last week to go to the United Nations Security Council uh, and get them to accept them uh, as, a, as a nation state. Uh, so they then could move forward without any negotiations with Israel at all. Uh, now they've threatened they're going to The Hague, to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, if they can join there via the United Nations, then they want to be able to bring criminal charges against uh, Israeli soldiers, Israeli officials in the state of, uh, of Israel and so forth. Uh, and there's a lot of internal politics that are going on uh, with that in Israel uh, today. But uh, again, uh, very tiny nation. There's going to be a, a massive group of, of people that come against them. Uh, and let's look, take a look at the alliance of, of who they are. Again, this is Ezekiel 38 in the first six verses. The prophet writing there says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, uh, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomar and all of its troops, the house of Togomar from the far north, and all of its troops, many people are with you. So. Uh, the first thing, uh, again, we see here is there is a leader. Uh, there is a head of an alliance. His title is Gog. Uh, Gog is just a title like the czar, like pharaoh, like president. So it's not a guy's name. It's not a country. There's one guy, uh, and he is over Magog. Magog, uh, identified by, uh, ancient, uh, by historians as ancient Scythians. Uh, who uh, migrated to southern Russia in the 7th and 8th century. Uh, well documented. Uh, Magog is, uh, is Russia. Gog is a supreme leader uh, that is going to take his nation, along with these other uh, confederation of uh, Islamic uh, nations, uh, into a war against Israel. Uh, in some ways, it's not that he, he uh, uh, wants to do that or whatever, but uh, Ezekiel says there's going to be a hook put in his jaw to draw him in. Uh, he may understand all of the geopolitical repercussions against the war against Israel, what it might do to his own economy, but there's going to be something that compels this one guy, this one leader, the bully on the block, to get all of his boys together uh, and go to war against Israel. Now, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal are references to Russia, Moscow, and uh, Toblish, which is uh, in uh, Siberia. Uh, but here's his alliance of other nations, Persia, verse uh, 5, which of course is... Uh, Iran today, Persia became Iran in March 1935, uh, and 79 became the Islamic Republic of Iran. Kush is uh, Ethiopia, parts of uh, Sudan. Put is uh, Libya, parts of North Africa, including Algeria, Tunisia. Gomar is the area of north uh, of Turkey, uh, and its uh, inhabitants uh, there. Uh, Togomar is Turkey, Armenia, Turkish-speaking people of Asia Minor and uh, Central Asia. So uh, we talk about Turkey, we're talking about uh, the old uh, Ottoman Empire that stretched from, from uh, North India uh, all the way up uh, into uh, uh, all of Spain uh, and, and half of France. Uh, now when you, uh, and, and, they, and they ruled it uh, is like ISIS. They were, they were the ISIS of their day. Uh, you're either with us or you're going to lose your head. That's, uh, that's how uh, the Ottoman Empire expanded. Uh, and uh, uh, they were incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful. I saw uh, and toured them. Um, uh, one of their ancient forts in uh, Lahore, Lahore, Pakistan, on one side. It was impressive. It was impressive. Uh, uh, these guys had uh, very smart uh, uh, technically and so forth for their day, uh, incredibly powerful, uh, and they, they conquered a lot of land. Uh, Turkey was the, the hub of all of that, and Turkey is in, uh, involved here uh, as well. A couple of things that are interesting about this is that, is that uh, even a few years ago, uh, you, you, we couldn't see, the, see this kind of uh, lining up because uh, Turkey for 75 years uh, was a secular state. Uh, they wanted to be part of the uh, European Union. They were allowed to join uh, NATO and so forth. Uh, they were kind of the European bridge to, to the Middle East and so forth. Uh, it was a great place to go to as a tourist and so forth, uh, but no more because of, of the uh, prime minister that took over and has uh, managed to stay in power for uh, a number of years ago, this guy uh, right here. Uh, Recep uh, Tayyip Erdogan. Uh, he has been moving the country for a number of years uh, to more of a Sharia law, uh, more of an Islamic state, uh, and so forth. And so now 
the idea of them cooperating with other Islamic countries against a war with Israel, well, it makes all the sense in the world. But a few years ago, even just a few years ago, they had wonderful relations with, with Israel. A lot of Jewish uh, Israelis would go to uh, Turkey uh, on vacations there in the Mediterranean and so forth. Uh, and uh, that all changed just a, a few years ago. What makes it interesting uh, is the fact that uh, uh, Turkey's got over uh, a half a million uh, active uh, uh, soldiers in their army. They have 950,000, almost a million uh, in reserve. It's a big country, 63 million people, the second most populous nation in the Middle East. Uh, and a few years ago, the most popular book selling in Istanbul was Mein Kampf. Uh, again, so they can learn all about the importance of hating the Jewish people uh, and the final solution of destroy them. Uh, this is a real turnaround. Now, Ezekiel said, in the last days, there's going to be this alliance of nations. <coughs> Ancient Persia and Russia have been enemies for centuries. Suddenly, they're aligned together very closely. Turkey, uh, which has been kind of a secular state and a friend of the West, part of the EU and so forth, holding the second largest army uh, of the European nation, uh, and all of a sudden, they have become uh, uh, very very uh, pro-Islam. Uh, uh, in effect, uh, uh, Erdogan a few years ago declared uh, a jihad against Israel to destroy Israel. The other thing that's interesting is uh, one of the countries that's not mentioned here, and that's Egypt. Uh, when uh, Egypt does not take part in this war, they are not involved in this war, uh, but a few years ago, the Muslim Brotherhood took over Egypt. Uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood is basically is a, is a terrorist organization that hates Israel. Uh, and if there had been a war against Israel, those guys would be all in. But Ezekiel said they're not all in. So if I was smart, I would have written a book predicting the overthrow of the Muslim Brotherhood. But I'm, I'm not smart. But uh, uh, according to Ezekiel, it just couldn't happen. Uh, but what has happened, of course, is we know the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, overthrown. Things of people uh, marched in the streets in Egypt to protest them and so forth. Military came in, took over, took a guy that was the chief justice of the Supreme Court, made him the temporary president. And now they're, uh, they're close allies with Israel. Uh, together, they are trying to fight Hamas there in the Gaza Strip. Together, they're both trying to root out terrorism uh, in their countries and so forth. Um, that would have uh, uh, been hard to see. As long as the Muslim Brotherhood was in a position, you have no Magog invasion. Uh, as long as Turkey is a secular state, you couldn't see the Magog invasion happening. But you have both of these. You have all the pieces kind of coming together uh, in, the, in the puzzle here. Again, the other uh, players in the confederation uh, that are involved, look over in chapter 39, verse 2. Uh, it talks about where the attack comes from. There's more details uh, there in that chapter that we won't cover, but it says, I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. So at least uh, a major portion of the attack will uh, be launched then from Syria and southern uh, Lebanon, again, the home of, uh, of Hezbollah who's been uh, arming themselves for a number of years for a war against Israel. Uh, they claim, and many people believe it's true, uh, they have over 100,000 missiles currently aimed at Israel, ready to go. Uh, yes, are, are, they, um, are they involved in, uh, in, the, in the fighting in Syria? They are, uh, but they're hoping for a let up or something so they can get back uh, to their real enemy, which is the nation of Israel. Now again, uh, there's an axis of evil we'll go through in the end, but it, it starts with Putin. It starts with Russia. Uh, they uh, export and sell weapons, like billions of dollars of weapons, to Iran. Iran takes a portion of those weapons and those missiles. They put them on commercial airlines, the kind that look like Hawaiian Airlines, except there's no seats in them. Uh, they're full of military hardware, and they then fly them uh, through commercial routes into Syria. They land them there, pull them in a hangar, uh, and unload them store them in warehouses, they've been doing this for a number of years, or they put them on convoys and take them right into southern Lebanon, and that's how most of those missiles have got there. The trouble is now, those missiles are becoming more and more sophisticated uh, and more and more dangerous for uh, the nation of Israel. Israel, in response, because their Iron Dome worked so well against the missiles of Hamas last summer, uh, they are currently, right now, uh, restructuring and rebuilding their missile defense system in the north, expecting a war like the one we're talking about here. Uh, praise God, the United States helped provide that uh, Iron Dome missile defense system. And uh, we're thankful for that because uh, we believe the Abrahamic covenant is still in play. I will bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. Uh, we'll be in real trouble 
we ever completely turns our back on Israel, which is a country we haven't done. So we're helping them with the uh, Iron Dome system. Israel's not waiting for them to attack. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, they launched uh, a group of uh, F-15s, F-16s, and went into Syria and actually took out some of the bigger mus missiles that were coming in uh, there. And I'm going to show you a little film clip uh, of that. And uh, a couple of things about the film clip um, I wanted to point out. <coughs> it's uh, right off YouTube. As you'll see it's a British guy. Uh, and uh, you'll tell by the way he presents the story, he is not pro-Israel. <laughs> Keep in mind that CNN and CNN International is owned over 90% by Saudi Arabia businessmen. <laughs> they are not pro-Israel. They influence the media that's out there in a tremendous way. Uh, the media in Great Britain today is very pro-Palestinian, pro-Islamic. Uh, uh, it is not uh, a friend of Israel by any means. Notice one of the key words he'll say. He'll say, they said in Tel Aviv, uh, that the reason for the mission was this. Is that their capital? Is that where the government is? Where is it? Jerusalem. He won't even say the word on the announcer. It's, it's really interesting. Let's, let, let's watch it. It's just like 90 seconds. Israel has openly intervened in Syria for the second time this year. This according to U.S. officials. They say Tel Aviv has carried out another bombing run on a target inside Syria. Uh, this uh, following a previous strike that goes back to January. Now, it's not immediately clear what exactly was targeted in this latest attack. Some officials uh, say it was an arms shipment on its way to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Others claim, though, it was a Syrian warehouse. Uh, so far, though, uh, neither Israel nor Damascus have confirmed the reports. But Tel Aviv has said in the past it would do everything possible to stop the Syrian government from handing weapons over to Hezbollah. Back in January, Israel bombed a convoy on the Syrian-Lebanese border. I do stay with RT for the latest on this uh, breaking news story. In fact, let's get some reaction now on this story here on RT. And uh, join uh, from California. Yeah, we don't, we don't really know why Israel did this, but, you know, someone in Tel Aviv said. <laughs> now, what's even funnier is that we had more time, but let's you watch the expert that they bring on. It's some guy in Berkeley uh, sitting in his garage on Skype, and he's the expert on the Middle East that they bring in, and he just rakes Israel over the coals, and I don't know if he says they blew up a laundromat or something, but he, you know, he's just kind of you know, like, uh, uh, this is how horrible it is what they've done. They're trying to protect themselves. Uh, there's a war coming uh, against them, and they do launch. That was that was December 14th. That wasn't. This is not like many years ago. This is all happening uh, uh, right now. Israel trying to uh, defend uh, themselves, and Ezekiel says the attack uh, will come from the north. There in chapter 39, uh, verse two. Uh, and Hezbollah certainly will be uh, uh, involved uh, in it. So the Magog invasion uh, will draw into itself an alliance of other nations. Uh, but the bully on the block is Russia, who calls really all the shots. Uh, the guy that's ahead of Russia is Putin right now. Uh, is he Gog of Magog? Well, he is right now. Somebody might off him tomorrow, you know, assassinate him, and then we'll see what happens. But right now, uh, he certainly uh, fills the bill. Well, let's look at the next uh, couple of verses. Magog will assault Israel. When the conditions are right, and the questions, uh, there's four of them, do we have those conditions today? Verse 7, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, uh, and be on guard for them. After many days you'll be visited. <clears throat> In the latter days you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which has long been desolate. Uh, they were brought uh, out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many peoples with you, thus says the Lord God. On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, Mr. Putin, uh, and you will make an evil plan. Uh, you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder. Here's the reason. To take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, uh, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? <clears throat> Therefore, son of man, <clears throat> prophesy and say to God, the ruler in Egypt, or, or, or Russia, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? So uh, four conditions. The first one is Israel's got to be gathered back in the land. 
The land that was once desolate that now has its people gathered back into it. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, uh, as of 2010, there were 5.7 million Jews living in Israel. And I point that out because that was the first time <coughs> that there were more <coughs> Jews living in Israel than there were in New York. <coughs> I think that's where the greatest concentration was. <coughs> I say that tongue in cheek, but for since 135 AD, <coughs> there has not been more Jews living in Israel than other places of the world. They are truly gathered back into the land. Uh, this is from January 2nd. That's, it was just a few days ago. Uh, and this is a statistic uh, uh, that uh, talks about 2014 was a record-breaking year in terms of Aliyah, which is uh, uh, if you're Jewish or part Jewish or you can prove that you're at least a quarter Jewish or so uh, and you can document that like friends of ours have done, then you can actually move back to Israel and become a citizen there. Uh, and the number of those uh, Jews leaving other countries where they have citizenship uh, and going and establishing themselves in Israel, uh, well, last year was a record-breaking year. Uh, one of the numbers uh, was uh, interesting. Uh, this article says, for the first time in Israel's history, France has topped the list of countries of origins for immigrants to Israel. 7,000 new immigrants from France arrived in Israel in 2014, more than twice as much as the 3,400 French immigrants who arrived uh, the year before. Why, why are they doing that? Why is there this surge now? It's because of the anti-Semitism in, uh, in Western Europe. Now, I did watch a video clip, and uh, if we had more time, I'd show you that. Uh, there was a march in Paris just a few weeks ago. Uh, and, um, and what they're doing is they're carrying signs and chanting down with the Jews and kill the Jews, right? Right through the streets of Paris. Uh, the officials of, uh, in, uh, in Paris not, are not even sure how to deal with, with the situation. There's been a, attacks against Jews, against uh, kids, against their mosque, against their businesses uh, throughout Paris and throughout France. Uh, and it's the same uh, throughout uh, West, Western Europe. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's forcing Jews uh, back into the land uh, at record numbers. We'd say that that condition has been met. The second condition for the assault uh, will be Israel needs to live in unwalled cities. We see that in verse uh, 11. Uh, now, there are no walled cities in, in Jerusalem today. There is a wall around that area we call the West Bank uh, because uh, during what's called the Second Infatada, <coughs> there were so many uh, Palestinians coming into Israel, into their supermarkets, into their synagogues, uh, into their restaurants, and then blowing themselves up and killing innocent uh, men and women and children. During that period of time, it would be hard for a Jewish person in Israel to not know someone or have a family member that was killed in one of those bombings. It was a horrific uh, time period. It virtually stopped tourism in uh, Israel. People were afraid to go there. Uh, so as a result, they built a wall. <laughs> it's a big one, uh, all the way around the West Bank. It's virtually stopped uh, those suicide attacks. They control who goes in and go, who goes out. Uh, we've done it on our last trip. We went to Bethlehem, uh, and it's like passing through immigration. It's like going into another country. It is another country, so it's the same, same thing. You've got to show your passport and go through and be searched and all the machines, and, and then you can go to Bethlehem. Now, once you're there, once we were there, we found out that <clears throat> unlike the, uh, the tour, which had been, uh, we went on 17 years prior, at that time, 85% uh, of the population of Bethlehem were Christian, 85%. Today, it's 10%, because they've just been driven out. There's so much persecution, they are just uh, forced to, uh, to leave those areas. So it's true, there is a wall uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, but there are not walled cities that are there. So we'd say that condition has certainly been met. Thirdly, the assault will take place during a time of Israel's prosperity, uh, and that's in verses uh, 12 uh, and, uh, and 13. Uh, you, know, you know, have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take livestock and goods, to take great plunder? So what's the plunder uh, that Russia would come uh, down for? Now, we talked about this before, uh, and, uh, and certainly it seems to be oil. Um, you know, there was a lot of Israelis that for years said, you know, <clears throat> how come God didn't give us the oil? <laughs> why, why do all these other nations have all the oil? Well, they just didn't look hard enough for it. It was just off sea. Uh, it was out there in the, in the Mediterranean. We've got a few pictures of some of, their, some of the offshoot uh, riggings. This is ya, uh, Yam Hadera. Uh, and then the next one is the, the big one, appropriate name, uh, Leviathan. Um, there's one more uh, shot of, of that. Uh, and this is a very recent uh, uh, quote here from the USGA. Today, Israel's known as the gas reserves are 30 trillion cubic feet. The United States Geological Survey says there's at least twice that amount still to be discovered in Israeli waters. 
That exceeds Israelis' energy needs for the next 30 to 50 years. Moreover, the USGS predicts there are 1.7 billion barrels of oil gas basins uh, as well. Uh, and, uh, and there's more of these. Uh, some of them have come online. Uh, they have all of their energy needs met. They no longer need to uh, uh, export uh, and bring in oil from anywhere else. Uh, and they are getting very close to being able to export oil uh, into the European market, which would not make Mr. Putin very happy because that's his bread and butter. Uh, and that's how he holds his thumb over the, uh, the nations in Western Europe. He supplies their oil. Don't give me a hard time. I'll cut your, uh, your oil off. But uh, if Israel comes in and begins to supply it, uh, well, that's, uh, that's a game changer. Uh, and we even said even of a few years ago when this began to happen, uh, perhaps uh, the discovery of the oil there uh, would be the thing that would bring Russia down uh, in what we call the Magog uh, in, uh, invasion. In terms of the prosperity of Israel, with a population of 7 million, Israel now is home to more than 6,600 millionaires. Of those, 70 possess liquid assets of more than 30 million. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have invested millions uh, into, uh, into Israel uh, and most of the, uh, a lot of the technology that we enjoy today, including your cell phones, your answering machines, prescription drugs, and we could go on and on. Uh, we're all created uh, and uh, uh, we derive the benefit from uh, Israeli uh, technicians and scientists that are hard at work. Uh, yeah, they, they, they have their, their problems socially and so forth, uh, but they are a prosperous nation. Uh, they don't have the kind of debt that Americans carry, uh, and so they were not hurt uh, during the 2008 uh, setbacks that uh, a lot of the world went through. Uh, they are doing quite well, and uh, we would say that condition uh, is met as well. Uh, the fourth one is a little more interesting. Uh, the assault will be in a time when Israel is living uh, in a period of safety. Uh, that's in verse uh, 14. Therefore, son of man... Prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? So uh, the word safely in the Hebrew lexicon literally means confidently. Now, I don't think anybody would look at Israel with uh, Hamas on the Gaza Strip, uh, with uh, Hezbollah and 100,000 uh, rockets aimed at them, uh, would feel like, man, we're really living in safety now. But uh, is it possible that they could be living confidently? or maybe at the most confidence that they've had uh, since the, the beginning of the nation in 1948. Uh, several things that Joel Rosenberg uh, mentioned in his book, Epicenter, a few years old now, but still, uh, I think, appropriate. Uh, Soviet Union has collapsed. Saddam Hussein is gone. Yasser Arafat is dead. Osama bin Laden is dead. Uh, they now have the uh, uh, peace treaty with Egypt because of the Muslim Brotherhood going away and the military taking over there and working very closely together. They have a peace treaty with uh, Jordan that's held for a number of years, uh, and they have a very strong, well-trained, equipped uh, army uh, and one of the most uh, advanced air forces in the world. Now, we sell them our F-15s and F-16s, uh, as we do to a lot of countries around the world, but it's basically a stripped-down version. There's not a lot to it other than it flies fast. Uh, but uh, they are able to recreate the kind of avionics that, uh, that we have as well. Uh, we would certainly say... I think appropriate that uh, Israel would be no match for the Air Force of the United States, but at the same time, they claim to have the most advanced uh, and the best Air Force in the world. And we're okay with them claiming that because it helps them. They need their enemies to, to believe that, uh, and uh, their enemies uh, do believe that. And one of the reasons uh, uh, is that um, they, they are training for war constantly uh, and, uh, and have to be ready uh, all the time. Uh, they have their uh, uh, aero missile defense system, and of course, we've mentioned the, uh, the Iron, Iron Dome system, over 90% effective against Hamas uh, through better intelligence, targeted assassinations of terrorist leaders, uh, the security fence I mentioned around Gaza and around the West Bank. Uh, they, they are a little more confident than they've uh, ever been before. Uh, last summer, again, because of the war in Hamas, uh, they finally kind of couldn't take it, having hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of missiles shot at them all the time. And they went in and destroyed all those smuggling tunnel, tunnels uh, and uh, at least at least for the time being, there it's not a peace, but they have a ceasefire that seems to be holding uh, with, uh, with Hamas. Uh, again, so a uh, very strong, uh, vibrant economy. And the question is, uh, are they confident? And uh, uh, is, is that condition met? I don't know if we can really answer that. Uh, certainly three out of the four conditions are there, uh, being back in the land and so forth. Uh, you know, again, un living in unwalled cities, very prosperous uh, economically, technically, and so forth. Uh, very, uh, maybe difficult to say, and they're living with a great deal of confidence, uh, but uh, uh, that could change, or maybe that, that condition is met uh, in, the, in their minds already. Uh, that leads us to uh, the invasion. 
verse 15 to 23, uh, Magog's invasion will allow God's purposes to be seen. There's a reason why God allows all of this to happen. <clears throat> verse 15, then you will come from your place out of the north. Again, he's talking about Russia and their leader. Uh, then you will come out of your place in the far north, you and many peoples with you. All of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. Uh, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud. I mean, there's a few of them to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. When I am, uh, when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord God. Are you of he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I will bring you against them? And it will come to pass at that time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. This is why God is allowing uh, it to happen. Magog's invasion will allow God to show the world his holiness. Uh, he will be hallowed in their, uh, in their sight. Uh, God is a God of righteousness, and he will judge, and there will be judgment coming. You know, you look, uh, if you've seen any of those video clips, I, and I don't know that you should watch them, but I've seen some of the ones of ISIS and so forth, the horrific things that are going on in the Middle East, and you, and, and you can say, uh, where is God? Well, he's watching, and he's coming. Uh, and the people that do those things, like this invasion, he's going to uh, deal with. Uh, secondly, Magog invasion will allow God to judge nations. That's in verse 17. That says the Lord God, are you he uh, of whom I have spoken in my former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days, I will bring you against them, and it will come to pass at the same time uh, when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord. Uh, God loves everybody, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, but he does judge nations. He judged his own nation. He judged his own people. Uh, they, he took them into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years, allowed them to be destroyed, and the, uh, and the, uh, the temple torn down and uh, desecrated, and the city of Jerusalem destroyed. God judges nations. If he does that to his own people, he'll do it to Gentile nations. Uh, we know that happens at the end of the tribulation period. It's going to happen to some degree uh, during this time period uh, as well. That's one of the other reasons God allows this to happen. The third one is that uh, so God's supernatural power can be seen. I don't know if you caught all that, but there's a massive earthquake. Uh, you've got um, uh, mountains falling down. Uh, every man's sword is against his brother. Uh, pestilence, bloodshed. Uh, you've got uh, a flooding rain, hailstone, fire, and brimstone. Uh, it's not the Israeli uh, IDF that defends them in the Magog invasion. Uh, it's God Almighty in, uh, in a super, supernatural way uh, that he defends them, and he <laughs> destroys the Russian army. He destroys Islam uh, as we know it today that come, come against us. This, and again, it's my, my view that this can happen, uh, and we might see it. The rapture could happen at any time. We might not see it, but we might see it, and if we do, we'll see the demise of Russia. Uh, when they're gone, the European Union will be able to rise to power. Uh, when it rises to power, eventually there'll be one man that will take control of it. We refer to him as the Antichrist. I, th I think, my personal opinion, this uh, Magog invasion sets the stage for the Great Tribulation. Uh, and that's how it all, uh, all comes about. Uh, again, over in the, uh, the last thing, the fourth thing about the invasion, it allows the world to see God's greatness, certainly in the supernatural. But uh, look at verse 23. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, there's going to be people watching this on TV uh, when, it, when it happens. 
uh, there'll be people seeing this all around the world. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of people coming to faith in Christ uh, as, a, as a result. Over in chapter 39, verse 21-22, uh, uh, it says, uh, There I will set my glory among the nations. All, how many? All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, uh, in my hand which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Uh, again, you catch that? All the nations are going to see God's glory as well as his uh, judgment. Now, uh, Joel Rosenberg uh, says the following uh, in his uh, part three of uh, the, the War of Gog and Magog. He says, today we're living in the first generation in human history where because of the miracle of global satellite television technology, people in every country on the planet will be able to watch the prophecies of the Bible come true before their very eyes. And that's exactly what uh, Ezekiel says is going to happen during this time. Uh, later in that article, Rosenberg says, as a result, I believe Ezekiel 38, 39 described the end of radical Islam and effectively the end of all Islam as we have known it. When the God of Israel destroys the forces of radical Islam supernaturally, while Muslims watch on Al Jazeera, how will they wake up the day after and believe the Quran is true and that Muhammad is a true prophet? The vast majority of Muslims will abandon Islam. Many will turn to faith in Jesus Christ. Not all, of course, but many will because they have seen the word of God come true right in front of them and the word uh, was God, and the word is God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and his name is Jesus uh, the Messiah. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason God allows all of this to happen. And there's a change in Israel. He says, and my people going this fo day forward will know me. Israel is a very secular nation. They have their gay pride parade right down the streets of Tel Aviv, just like they do in San Francisco. A lot of religious people there, people that love the Lord, but it's a very secular place. Uh, they don't recognize God. They're not seeking after God. Uh, but uh, when this happens and God supernaturally defends them, uh, it's a game changer around the world, uh, and certainly in the Islamic countries, uh, and with Israel uh, in particular. That leads us to the idea of the axis of evil uh, having already been formed. Uh, again, the axis of evil has a leader. Uh, and uh, again, who is Gog? And I've, I've pretty much already uh, identified him. I think we've got a picture of uh, Mr. Uh, Putin here. Uh, he comes to power in 2000. That's a long time ago. <laughs> We've been through a few presidents since then. Uh, he ran out his term limit. Then he took his uh, underling uh, and put him in power for a few years, but still called the shots. As soon as he was done, then he stepped right back into power again. Uh, he, since he took office in May 2000, has dismantled uh, much of the democracy in Russia. He's moved the uh, Russian economy to a more socialized model. He's completely taken over the Russian uh, media. He rebuilt uh, the Russian uh, military, as we've, uh, we've mentioned, uh, and he's formed alliances uh, with uh, some of the worst uh, of our enemies in terms of the uh, Islamic countries, including Iran and North Korea. Uh, he's attempting to uh, make himself the new czar uh, of Russia. Uh, again, it was in 2004 that he uh, uh, increased the budget 40% for the military. Uh, he runs uh, uh, periodic uh, uh, war gaming, simulating uh, nuclear attacks on the United States. Currently, uh, he flies his long-range bombers armed with nuclear weapons as close as 30 miles off the coast of California. There was just an article a few weeks ago flying them right through the Gulf of Mexico, very close uh, to the United States. Our, uh, our F-15s are in case of Alaska 22 scramble, they intercept, they, uh, they, uh, they uh, say we appreciate you leaving the neighborhood right now, uh, and they, they comply and everything. Uh, but he is pushing, what can he do? What can he get away with? Uh, very, uh, very aggressive uh, uh, guys. Uh, even causing, uh, in one article I read, one of China, China's uh, leaders, uh, uh, they are worried about the, quote, the resurrection of the Russian uh, military. Um, and uh, uh, years ago, uh, as uh, the uh, crisis in uh, uh, the Ukraine began to develop, he got involved there. And of course, then uh, we know it was only uh, this last year that he invaded the Crimea. Uh, and completely took it over. I mean, just invaded another country and, and took a chunk of it. It's like somebody invading and taking over California or whatever. And, uh, uh, and the rest of the world did nothing. <laughs> they did nothing. Uh, there's, there's nobody right now that will uh, uh, stand uh, up to this guy. 
And he does it for a reason. It's very interesting. He needs another warm water port uh, for his submarines. And he's got it now. And he's got access out to the Mediterranean. He's already got a naval port uh, in the Mediterranean in Syria. Uh, and while that whole debacle with the, uh, the Islamic Brotherhood was going on in Egypt, he was down there cutting deals to get a, a navy port uh, in the Mediterranean there. This is all very, very helpful if you were going to be uh, invading uh, uh, Israel. Uh, in terms of the, the media there, and I'll show you a little clip here to uh, illustrate this in, in a moment. There's, uh, uh, just to show you a couple of gals, uh, sh uh, this gal, uh, Anna, was a uh, uh, high-profile writer in, in Russia. She was assassinated. Uh, the, next, the next guy, uh, he was, he was uh, very highly publicized, uh, Levendikov. Uh, he was all the way in London hiding from the guy. <clears throat> they got to him, and they poised him uh, with the isotopes that could be traced directly back to Russia. I mean, uh, and when they take somebody out, it's like a professional hit. Uh, it's like uh, in a public elevator, bullets uh, between the eyes kind of a thing. They want people to know. It's not like, oh, he opposed Putin. I wonder what happened to him. No, people don't wonder what happened. They know exactly what happened. Uh, and this continues uh, today. Uh, he's just launched a, a new big uh, uh, media center called Sputnik. Uh, and um, uh, he, he wants to, uh, to be the next czar. Uh, he said the following uh, in an article a number of years ago, uh, Putin speaking, from the beginning, Russia has created, was created as a super centralized state. Uh, that's practically laid down in its genetic code, its traditions, and the mentality of its people, said Putin, adding, in certain periods of time, in certain place, under certain conditions, monarchy has played and continues to this day to play a positive role. The monarch doesn't have to worry about whether or not he will be elected or about petty political interest or about how to influence the electorate. He can think about the destiny of the people and not become distracted with trivialities. And, and uh, I'll, I'll show you the, the, the clip here in a moment. So uh, and the, the deal with it is that because, again, I, I think I might have mentioned to you already that uh, the Russian economy cannot sustain itself uh, on oil uh, if it drops below $70 a barrel. Uh, it's, uh, it's at 62 as a few weeks ago. It's supposed to stay down uh, for quite a while. Uh, the reason that it's staying down is because the OPEC nation, Saudi Arabia and the others, they are afraid of Russia, and they are afraid of Iran. They don't want to get uh, Iran to get a, a nuclear bomb uh, because they'll be coming after them. They'll, they'll rule the, the Middle East. And so therefore, uh, when there's an increase of oil on the market because of an increase here in the United States, uh, then what OPEC normally would do is, is decrease their production. Less oil available, the price stays up. They're pumping oil like crazy because they want to drive the price into the cellar uh, in order to stop Putin and stop uh, Iran. Uh, but it's crippling his economy uh, and, uh, and hurting the, the Russian people uh, tremendously. Now, in this video clip, it's just an average couple. They're gonna, things to listen to. They go to the grocery store one day. They go the next week. Groceries are 40% more. <laughs> That's a big raise. Uh, and yet, in all of this, uh, Putin, because he controls the media, uh, he's still seen as the hero and the good guy. Because after all, it's the United States that's creating the problem. Uh, let's, let's watch this clip from uh, uh, news of, uh, about a week ago. Ruslan Yakurlov works in a state-owned company and voted for Russian President Vladimir Putin. Middle class and comfortable until the ruble lost half its value to the dollar, driving the cost of basic goods like food, much of it imported, up 40%. Then his partner, Elena Skukova, a logistics manager, lost her job. As sinking oil prices and Western sanctions squeeze the economy, Elena and Ruslan are feeling the pinch. We're living from hand to mouth right now, he said. Like millions of Russians, we live on credit. We've got a car loan, lots of debts. Now we can't even pay any of them off. They are the faces of the Russian crisis. So is this, another soup kitchen sprouting up across bitterly cold Moscow. And this, more runs on the bank by desperate Russians, buying up anything of value before prices soar even higher. People are panicking, she said. We have no idea what will happen next, said this saleswoman. But instead of revolting, Russians are adapting, cutting back on shopping and travel. The lot of that old Soviet mainstay has made a comeback. And if Russians must fly, they're taking Pobieda Airlines, a new Russian jet blue. Tickets just $20 inside Russia. We used to take vacations abroad, like Spain, she said, but it's just too costly now. Still, some angry Russians have taken to the streets. Hundreds of doctors and nurses recently protested against massive cuts in state health care, calling for real economic reforms. 
Even on the brink of recession, Putin is popular among a whopping 81% of Russians. Elena and Ruslan among them. I blame America for this situation, he said. They want to conquer the world and be number one. In control of virtually all of Russian media, including this new mega million dollar news agency called Sputnik, Putin has so far dodged any political damage by hammering home one message. That the West is out to get Russia. Uh, the White House wants to bring about regime change inside Russia, and he's defending Russia against these external enemies. The Russian bear flexing its muscles with war games and Russian fighter jets patrolling NATO airspace in numbers unseen since the Cold War. He is more aggressive than many Soviet leaders were at the end of the Cold War. Putin, confident, asked Russians for two more years to resolve the current crisis, even as some Russian analysts warned that his oil-based economy and aggressive Ukraine policies are a ticking bomb. If crisis will deepen, which most likely it will do, and if it will be quite prolonged, then of course, uh, sooner or later, it will have impact on popularity. But Vladimir Putin knows his base, calling for a price freeze this week on vodka, a Russian staple. A quick fix certain to please his people, but for how long? Jim Maceda, NBC News. Groceries cost 40 percent more, but vodka stayed the same, so we're all right there. I don't know if you got that, but uh, yeah, he's still getting all of the. You can imagine if groceries doubled in price next week, there'd be a couple of people a little upset. But 81 uh, percent think Putin's the guy. He's defending us uh, against the great uh, USA and so forth. Uh, he's a guy like is described uh, in this prophecy: Gog, a, a ruler, a guy that can call the shots himself, sees himself as the news are of, uh, of Russia, uh, and can move uh, against them. The, uh, uh, again, it's just very, very interesting to watch all of this go down. Again, the, the other major players as far as the axis of evil remains North Korea. Uh, he had a close relationship with Kim Jong-il. Since he was ill, he's no longer with us, and his son is now reigning. I was going to show you a slide of him, but I was afraid to. I thought if I said anything bad, my computer might get hacked. <laughs> I'm just going to let that alone. But they've continued, just to say they've continued the, uh, uh, the re relationship. 2004, the CIA estimated that North Korea had at least six nuclear weapons by 2007. Obviously, uh, we're way past that. Could produce another highly uh, uh, enriched uranium to produce another six. So they're they're way beyond that. But when uh, when the North Koreans launch a missile, there's Iranian scientists that are there and Russian scientists that are there. Uh, when there's testing going on, these guys are in complete cooperation uh, with each other. Uh, there is an uh, an axis uh, of evil. Uh, when uh, Putin uh, was invited to North Korea by Kim Jong-un for the first time uh, next year, uh, and he'll be, uh, he'll be speaking there. Uh, that was announced just on December 19th uh, of last year. Uh, again, they've sent a uh, billion dollars in arms uh, in Iran, uh, and uh, from Iran, uh, those weapons are then spread uh, to Hezbollah and to other terrorists uh, around the world. Just one last word uh, is about their theology. Uh, you had uh, Ahmadinejad that we talked about before, uh, no longer uh, the president uh, of Iran. Uh, you have uh, Rouhani, who uh, paints himself to be a moderate, uh, but if he was a moderate, the Ayatollah wouldn't allow him to be in power. They shared the theology of the 12th Imam, uh, uh, the idea that in their Shiite theology, they believe there's a Messiah coming. Uh, and, uh, and when he comes, he will be able to, he'll be powerful, sent from God. He'll be able to reestablish uh, the caliphate. He'll be able to convince the Sunnis to, to join them, and basically they're going to take over the world. That's their, uh, that's their theology, uh, and uh, we can say a lot more about it. But the whole, their whole thinking is uh, what they need to do to hasten his return is to create cataclysmic events in the Middle East like a nuclear war, like a war. They don't have to win the war. They only have to create the conditions for the Mahdi to return. And when he does, then he's the one that will have victory over the uh, infidels and so forth. So the, the idea of the Iranians having uh, nuclear weapons uh, is not a, uh, it's not a rational. We're not dealing with rational people here. Uh, there, we can't say to them, well, we've got uh, more nuclear weapons than you do. And if you shoot yours, and we're going to shoot ours. They don't really care uh, about that. They just believe theologically uh, they have to create uh, an end time scenario and then their Messiah will show up and, uh, and win the day. Anyway, those are the days that we're living in. Uh, and uh, again, the, 
I, I wasn't sure if I'd get to teach this before it actually happened. And then we would just watch the news footage or something. Uh, but uh, uh, we always kind of wonder, what would be the hook in the jaw? We've wondered this for years, to bring Russia into, it seems like they don't really want to, there's a reluctance, but there's a hook in the jaw. They are brought uh, uh, in uh, to this war against Israel. God shows his might on behalf of the people, uh, and that changes the world, I think, setting the world up for the rise of the European Union uh, and taking us into the Great uh, Tribulation. We may see it, or we may be gone before them because uh, of the rapture of, of the church. And this price in the oil dropping is, uh, is huge in terms of a game changer. That, that could be the hook in the jaw that does it. We'll have to uh, wait and see. What we do want to do is recognize that the Bible does predict things, and they always come true. Uh, and we can believe that they come true. Uh, and we should see the days that we're living in so that we can change our behavior. Uh, I've used it many times, but just to, uh, once again to help illustrate why I do a message like this. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was, uh, we were still living in Kaneohe, and I was driving over the, uh, the Saddleback Hill that comes down into Kailua. And those of you that drive that periodically, you know that coming down uh, there, uh, there's a signal at the bottom with uh, Kalahale High School on one side. And that area is what we call a speed trap. As the, uh, you come down here, it's, it's two lanes uh, divided. Uh, it's 35, and it drops to uh, uh, 25 at the bottom, just like it's very easy to be doing the uh, the 35 and the five miles of grace that he give you. Uh, it's, uh, it's easy to be doing the, the 35 or 40 and all of a sudden you're in a 25 uh, and there's a guy down there at the bottom of the hill and he looks like he's got a, a, a hair dryer in his hand. Uh, it's not a hair dryer, that's a little radar gun. Uh, and I, I was kind of used to this, but you kind of forget sometimes that I was driving up the hill one day uh, and at the crest of the hill was a guy up there uh, weed whacking and he saw me coming up the hill and he put down his weed whacker and he went like this. He wasn't uh, worshiping me. <laughs> I knew exactly what he meant. He was telling me to slow down. He was telling me to slow down because from his vantage point, he could look into my future. <laughs> right? I mean, he could look on the other side of the hill. And he could see my future. And he warned me about the future. I took his warning. I changed my behavior as a result of knowing what was coming in the future. That's what prophecy is meant to do, authenticate God's word, uh, tells us what's coming in the future, that it might change our behavior, as Peter would say, that we might live more godly lives, uh, that we'd be realizing we, we got a real limited time here to uh, live our lives out with real uh, authenticity uh, before other people uh, and share the gospel with as many people as we can uh, because our days are numbered. So that's what we want to think about uh, going forward in 2015. Amen.